Welcome to Conservation Talks. My name is Saurabha Rao and I work with the Communications and Outreach team. I am delighted to introduce to you today's distinguished guest, Mr. Rajiv Mr. John is a community-based natural resource management specialist with over 20 years experience in decentralized governance and natural resource management focused on establishing community-based conservation incentive schemes in Cambodia and Myanmar that result in agreements with local communities explicitly linking the income to the management of habitat and the protection of key conservation species. Conservation requires time to rehabilitate wildlife and wild places. Local communities, indigenous and non-indigenous, play a critical role in how this rehabilitation can happen. Engaging communities in conservation so that protecting the habitat and wildlife becomes part of their livelihood, uh, be becomes part of their livelihood critical in these conditions, especially when wildlife are outside protected areas or in vulnerable areas of the protected areas. This talk is about engaging communities with this long-term objective of engaging them in conservation as done in Cambodia and Myanmar. Mr. John will be talking about facilitated framework strategies for effective community engagement. Should you have any questions after the talk, please raise your hand or leave the questions in the chat box and we'll go for Party, welcome to Lisa. Mr. John, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I couldn't get the last part. So. Yeah, over to you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ashish John, and like Saraba uh, explained, uh, I've been working in Cambodia for 20 years, but I'm from the Northeast India. And uh, uh, this is a facilitator's framework that we and explains how we work with communities in Cambodia. And basically, this framework was developed by me in uh, during my work in Cambodia. And like Saraba mentioned, it's based on the fact that conservation conservation takes a long time, fifty to hundred years. Birds may be quicker, but wildlife and uh, forests take a long time to rehabilitate. And the communities then re that remain in these areas, they also change, and they but they play a very important role in how these areas are managed or how this wildlife is protected. And but we need to continue. We need their continued support for conservation. So this is where the brief introduction. And please feel free to stop me whenever I go too fast or I get confusing or just shout. Uh, I'm not used to raising hands and I'm not used to this yeah uh, Zoom thing. So I'll have to get used to that. We are all old people, I think. Yeah. And also, yeah. Uh, yeah, just call me Ashish. It's much easier. Uh, that'd be, yeah. Thank you. So, do I start? Yes, sir, please. Yes, Ashish. Uh, okay. Now I need to. Okay, sorry. Uh, mm -mm -mm. Okay. What's happening? Okay. Where do I go to share screen now? Okay. Uh, uh, Ashish, yes. uh, you have screen, you can just uh, click present. What? Uh, so... uh, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've shared your screen already. You just need to go to uh, present. So if you go at the top. Ah, okay, go. okay. Thank you. Sorry. Or, or, yeah. yeah, perfect. Or, okay, so you can. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. So this is the map of Cambodia. And uh, we work in uh, many different areas, but these are the two areas. One is the Northern Plains and the Eastern Plains, where we have what we call the landscape approach. And in these areas, the, uh, the WCS works with the park to support the 
uh, law enforcement teams. They do the patrolling. Then we have the biodiversity teams that do the uh, wildlife surveys. And we have a third team called the community team that helps the park work with the communities. And so in Cambodia, there are communities inside the park. There are quite a few, a lot of communities. So this park has about 20,000 people inside the park. And so we need to work with them to try and find a way so that they cooperate with us. And this park here, this is the Kaosema, which I'm in at the moment. This also has about 20 indigenous villages. And so this is how this framework was developed to try and work with these communities so that the park, the facilitators and everyone can work together with the communities. So, uh, this is the framework that we call facilitators framework. We will go into this one by one, but we I'll explain it slowly. But in the beginning, yeah, we need to basically what uh, sorry. So how we work with them is we identify a group of members in the community that we work with. So these can be focal persons. In Cambodia, we call them committees. Sometimes in other places, they can be the biodiversity rangers that help the biodiversity teams collect uh, information. These are community members that are hired by the project. And so we work with them and we basically work with them so that they are motivated to work with us. And that depends on very much as we will go later on. And then once they are motivated, they try to get the mandate to be able to implement some of their decisions, some of the work that they do. And once they get the mandate, they have to have a clear structure of how decisions are made. And uh, then finally, this group has to get the power. So the political and social power so that the village listens to them. And they need to have skills, resource, and knowledge so that they can convince the other members of the community uh, that uh, they need to go in this direction. So this is the framework, and we will discuss it later on. But before we go into the framework, we need this thing to happen at the individual level, at the committee level, committee or the focal persons we work with, and at the community level. So that are three levels that these people have to come together and uh, understand the framework and we get them through that. So if you look at the community, this is the community we established. It's not very big. And basically they need to work with other people in the community. So the traditional decision makers, these are, these are very important people. And these people have to work with them. Then you have the government installed decision makers like the village chiefs. In India, you have the panchayats. In, in, in Cambodia, we have the commune councils. So these are government installed decision makers that make decisions on how things function in the village. And a, other people inside the village, these are influential members that are existing in that village, like political, affi politically affiliated leaders. Some of them are also middlemen who sell products outside. Some of them are also influential e hunters who are doing illegal activity in the village. And so this committee has to work with all these different groups, plus there are different groups within the community. Sometimes there is class, sometimes there is religious groups, sometimes there is political groups. All these different groups are in the village. So that committee that we established has to basically go through all this and come to some understanding of how the village wants to implement some of the pro uh, activities that we uh, provide them. And the other important people are officials, government officials who interact with this community. These are important, like health workers, uh, the district uh, commissioner, all these people, they do come in and they basically spread something. And sometimes also politicians, they play a very important role in how things happen inside this. 
Then there is the other outsiders that are there, the NGO workers that come into the village, plus the very important people are the middlemen who come from outside and buy products from the village. They play a very important role in informing the village how things happen outside. And so these are the different things uh, that influence decision making in the village. And one of the most important things is also history. In Cambodia, uh, there was the Khmer Rouge. And so the village is divided into two groups, the old people and the new people. The old people are people who were in the village, who basically were supported by the Khmer Rouge. While the new people were the educated people who were made to work in the paddy fields, and many of them died and were killed by the old people. So the history also plays a very important role in how a village comes together. And this is what this committee that we established sometimes has to go through and look at the different things that are happening in the village. And our facilitators also need to try and take all this into account. So just an example of uh, how an NGO project also uh, influences what happens, affects this committee. So these are the three villages, Tumapoy, Preveng, and Dongplat. And this is the WCS project in Preve here. So we had, during the time we were there, we had four uh, uh, country directors. We had four landscape directors, one of them was me. And then we had community advisors, uh, two of them. And all these people, they influenced the strategy and what activities are emphasized or given uh, priority. And basically this is what happens in the village is for the committee, all the strategic decisions that happen inside the NGO, it affects how and what they do in the village. And then we have also the people who interact directly with the community like the uh, team leader and the uh, staff that go to the village. Some of these people are arrogant, some of them are nice, some of them are friendly, some of them are cold. And so, again, the committee has to go through, understand how these different people interact. And so, uh, over time, these committees have to start learning that they need to take over much of the activities. Uh, but these changes happen in an NGO. But these are different small changes. But if you look and there are other changes that happen, like in this case, if you look at Tumapoy and Preveng, they were under the Ministry of Environment when we started, while Dongplat was under the Forestry Administration. So in Cambodia, there are two institutions that were having protected areas. So one was the Ministry of Environment and the other was the uh, Forestry Administration. And they had different laws and uh, different uh, ways of working with communities. And uh, so while this was happening, while we were working with the village, the prime minister, we were doing land use planning and giving, asking them, okay, these areas are good for wildlife. So you protected these areas, good for agriculture. You do this, you do that. And everything was happening. The prime minister decided he is going to give a uh, land title to the poor people. And so he hired a group of students who went around uh, giving land titles to uh, communities. And that basically affected much of the work we did because the villagers suddenly wanted land titles, which we couldn't give as an NGO. And uh, uh, luckily it didn't come to our area, but there was a lot of tension because the community wanted land titling and uh, we were worried that if it came in, we, we would call, they would cause some problems because uh, land titling means a lot of conflict. And then the next thing was, while we de developed all this and we told the villages, okay, this is conservation area, this is, uh, you can use these areas and all that. Suddenly the government decided the areas we were saying conservation and important for wildlife, they put concessions in there which got the villagers really angry and said, you are working with the government to take away our land because we wanted to go there and you put us here. And you gave the good land to the 
concessions and we had to negotiate and basically the committee members had to have a lot of issues to deal with because then while all this was happening, uh, the prime minister overnight decided that all the protected areas should be managed by one department and that is Ministry of Environment. So Dong Plat Village overnight went under forestry administration and uh, the protected forest went under forestry administration. And we had to basically figure out yeah, who, who is going to be there, what are the staff coming there and a lot of issues. And so, yeah, it affected much of the work we were doing. And then the government decided it's a, because of the World Bank and other things that it's a good idea to deconcentrate. So basically till about this time, the project manager, the park managers were from the central government and they had very a lot of influence and they used to avoid the province. The province is like the state state government and they could uh, do enforcement directly and uh, they could uh, do pro programs directly in the field and they were much more educated much better educated and much more aware of the situation and they were able to interact with us but when this deconcentration happened the project managers went under the state government or the provincial government and it became as low as the district level district officials and this affected the quality and their ability to deal with issues and that suddenly changed the whole playing ground so as you can see these are changes that we, the project cannot do much these are changes that happen because of other reasons but it affects the implementation of the activities and each time things happen the committee has to basically adjust and try and find a way to continue working on what they have done and while all this was happening we have this wonderful thing for illegal logging that was happening all over and uh yeah so you can see that it's very much depends on how the committee decides to function and how they deal with these issues because it becomes uh, they have to deal with a lot of different issues and we basically are coming from outside and trying to tell them so and so this is where we look at all that and we say yes uh, it's very important in the beginning that uh, yeah this is critical is the motivation is it's a kind of a desire to complete or achieve something. And this is basically based on whether people think is ethically correct or not. And this ethics is each person has their own principles and values to decide what is right or wrong. We may tell them, we may advise them, but finally it's a personal decision that they continue working on the activities that they wanted to do. It's because of this strong personal conviction that that's the right thing to do. And uh, so this also comes if they are able to get support from the village. The village has to support what they are doing and it is they think that it is appropriate and accepted. And it's also culturally acceptable in the community to do what they are doing and it doesn't affect the livelihood too much. And the more important one also is the benefits. The question is, what are the benefits? These are benefits uh, that are tangible. It's what am I going to get out of this? Uh, this can be a religious benefit, cultural or financial, but it has to be very clear. And what the community and the, com the person who is uh, the committee member can actually see or taste, I think, yeah, that's the thing, is they must feel it. And they must understand that, yes, I'm going to get this benefit, and either now or in the long run. And this is where uh, they start working on whatever they want to do. So this is where, if for motivation, it's very important they have an idea of where they want to go, what they want to achieve, and 
how they plan to reach there. So that is very important. And based on that, they can try and convince the community that maybe this is a good idea. Let us work on this and let us do it together. Is there any problem or is that okay? Yes, yeah, it's fine. Okay, thank you. So that is the motivation. So th this has to be motivation that they understand that they will benefit from it, not us, not the project, not the world, not the climate. It has to be, what are we going to get out of it? So, and once they, have, they are motivated, then we try and help them try and get the mandate. Mandate is, okay, there are le uh, uh, legal procedures and legal laws that exist. What are the laws they can use? What are the rights they have under these laws? And once they want to protect a part of the forest or they want to protect wildlife, uh, something, what are the laws that help them do that? And what do they need to uh, achieve in order to be able to do that? I think that is what we work with them and they uh, work on it. Plus, there has to be a kind of ownership on the decisions. Okay, this is our decisions. This is what we want to apply. Number two, these are our wildlife, but these are my forests. That's why we want to protect them. And this is, so these are, this is a kind of feeling that, okay, this is, we need to try and get that in there. So in some villages where the giant ibis were there, the villages said that this is our ancestors. We need to protect it. And so something like that, uh, we use things like that to help the community negotiate with the village to try and protect certain species or certain things. So yeah, I mean, a kind of feeling that they it belongs to them or yeah so yeah so the going through that they need to understand the laws and they need to identify a process that will give them this power to be able to do that and then the next thing is we help them try and develop a structure a structure is kind of first thing is what is right and what is wrong what can they do, what they cannot do, and who decides what is right and wrong, and how these uh, decisions are made, and why are these decisions being made. And that's very, it's very important. And then they have to have procedures for financial pro procedures, administrative procedures, and also decision-making. Okay, we've made a decision that we need to do this, but we, how do we apply those decisions without creating conflict in the village? And so all this is agreed on. So one thing you will think is villages, the personal relationship is more important than a professional relationship. And they tend to support personal relationships because the personal relationships are very important for them. And they need to, it's based on that, that they interact in the village. But they need to make decisions also. So how are these decisions being made? It's very important. So I give an example for what happened with one of the committee members. So we have this IBIS rice program where we work with villages and they develop a land use plan which protects the wildlife. And then they follow the organic rules and regulations. And the rice is bought from them at a higher price. So there was a young committee member who had married recently. And he basically yeah, was a committee member. And the committee and the village decided his father-in-law broke the rules and didn't buy from him. And immediately, the father-in-law stopped talking to his son-in-law. And we asked him, what are you going to do? He says, do you want us to do anything? He says, no, you can't do anything. You, you could make it worse. Just let it be. And so, yeah, it happened, it continued for a week. And uh, finally, the village elders and all the committee members uh, went and talked to the father-in-law and said, look, this is not an individual decision. Your son-in-law didn't make this decision by himself. It's the whole group. And these are the rules. And we already agreed to these guidelines and all these things. And uh, yes, uh, 
you did break the rule and you, your son-in-law didn't say that, but somebody else said it and uh, your son-in-law could not protect you. And so he accepted that and he started talking to his son-in-law, but the relationship was never the same again. And so this is where is for the son-in-law to continue working. It was a personal choice that he thought that maybe this is more important than the, the relationship with his father-in-law will take time, but what he was doing was more important. So these are the kind of things that happen within the village and uh, decision-making in the village can be influenced by many things. And we need to be sensitive and uh, listen to our committee members when we help them make these decisions. Then the other thing we do is try and help the committee get the power. Power is, political power is like we, I presented, there are many decision makers in the village. And how do you influence those decision makers in the village? And when you try to influence the decision makers, there's a lot of give and take. There is adjustments and negotiations and uh, it's very, they have to come to some agreement on how to apply the rules and how to make those decisions. But yes, uh, always there is a kind of negotiation and uh, personal links that come into the picture when those, when they get the political power. And again, they also need social power where the village respects and trusts them. So we need to build that and help them build that. So there are cases where we don't have to force them, but like same in the Ibis rice process where they were buying rice and WCS did not have money. So the committee decided that, okay, we will buy one ton of rice from each village, each committee member that has not broken the rules. And then the chief, he was very angry. He basically bought five tons from himself and one ton from everybody else. And when we told him, you will, it will cause problem. He was saying, no, if you don't do this, I will resign. So we said, okay. And then basically we asked, the community to display how many tons of rice was bought from each person. And that had to be displayed afterwards. And uh, basically everyone looked at five tons by the committee chief and everyone started asking, how come he's got five tons and everybody else is one ton? Why, why is it like this? And so the committee chief got up and said, I'm very sorry, uh, I will not do this again. Uh, this was the first time. And uh, so these kind of things is rather than trying to stop them, we sometimes also let them uh, go through the process and get burned a bit so that they improve this. So this is kind of, uh, yeah, how do you work through this decision making? How do you get the trust of the community? And how does your system uh, is accepted by the village is very important. Then, but the important thing is what we also learned is uh, when people work with NGOs, especially conservation NGOs, and we actually control the patrol teams, then people in the village uh, who work with us get a lot of power and they have a lot of influence on how decisions are being made. So on where the patrol team goes and where the patrol team sometimes, because there are people who, uh, what we call, inform the patrol team that there is illegal activities here or things like that. So these people play a very important role within the community, but they also have a lot of power. And uh, of even this, the committee has a lot of power, but we need to make sure that this power the committee and the village understand this power that the committee have is because of the village, because the village agrees to what they have done and the village is supporting them, not because that an outside NGO is supporting them and that that becomes artificial and moment we leave, the committee collapses. So we have to make that very clear and they need to be very sure about that. 
And this, I think this is uh, team skills. Uh, they need skills to report to the government. They need skills to talk with the government officials. They need skills to uh, solve conflicts, uh, listening, talking, and all these things. But the other thing is what the, they need resources is especially financial capacity. Uh, com uh, what we found out is the committees that are able to bring money to the village, they are much more powerful than committees that are not able to bring in income to the village. And so villages, uh, committees that are able to do this, like we, I will explain later on, uh, ecotourism committees that are bringing tourists and earning money, wildlife friendly rice, that is the thing. And so these committees are much more stronger where they decide how money is spent in the village and how this is done. But yeah. And then we have what we call, uh, again, academic awareness is like what we found is like in the giant ibis case where we told them that uh, this bird is this about six to 700 birds in the world and about 30 of uh, six of them are in your village. The village was so impressed that they basically immediately passed a de uh, declaration that nobody will hunt this ibis. So that kind of awareness helps a lot. And uh, basically, but we have to be clear is how we present it and what we do with it. So, so this is the uh, coming back to this structure and uh, just an ex uh, explanation of how the teams worked in Cambodia. So the motivation we have, what we call the Red Plus project. A Red Plus project is where the money comes to the community based on their compliance on how they have protected the forest in that year. So if they protect it well, then there is a team of people who basically monitor how the forests have been cleared and if they have been protected, if the community is patrolling and all these things, and that they get marks. And based on those marks, they get some money from maybe $5,000 to $10,000 a year. So that's something that they use to develop in the village. Then we have the livelihood projects, like we say the Ibis rice, which basically, uh, helps the community develop land use plans, uh, looking at which habitats are important for birds, which they can use for growing rice and all these things. And basically the community develops a plan and uh, they grow organic rice. And basically once they uh, do both, then an organization buys the rice from them at almost double the price from the market. And they basically, because of that, they get money. Uh, they earn almost double the amount of rice uh, money from each of these activities. And then you have the tourism where the committee basically manages a guest house and they take tourists and uh, feed them and keep them and show them the wildlife. So the guide, bird guides get money, the community gets money. And so there is a direct link between conservation and uh, uh, the, uh, the income, uh, and that is where we think uh, motivation comes from. Then we work with the community to uh, ask them to work on two areas. One is called CPA. This is the community protected area. Community protected area is a legal uh, provision given by the protected area law, where a community can request for an area in the park that they would like to manage and use for their livelihood and also for building houses. And so they basically obtain these rights through a certain steps and there is thing, and they obtain that right. So this is the community protected area. And then we also have the ICT process. This is indigenous communal land titling process where again, indigenous communities have the right to request land inside the park to continue the traditional way of life which includes Sweden agriculture in specific areas that they have mapped. And the other areas they basically leave. 
And so we help the community develop this, uh, go through this process, and they develop their rules, their regulations. It's a very long process. And they get the rights to manage a part of the park. And once all that, this, this, all these things have structures of how they basically function within the community and across the community and the different things. But we try to work with them so that they are able to work with the different structures in the community, the government officials, park authorities. So we help them develop joint patrols, the committee and the park rangers, they develop joint patrol programs, and also the compliance where the government when monitors this compliance, whether they are pro uh, protecting the forest around them or are they uh, cutting the forest around them, what are they doing to protect the land and the forest. So all these things, basically, there is a structure and a process. And yeah, it looks nice. But yeah, uh, finally, when you implement it, uh, it means it's at a personal level, like we say. It's, it's, I mean, the government may say something, but how the village implements it is very different. Sometimes they do, they don't implement it as harshly as the government would want them to. And uh, uh, they're still negotiating those terms. And also we are still working with the government uh, as to which department in the government will support the community uh, do all this. And at the, then once these committees are established, we help them basically get the power, like political power is approach government officials with the problems. If outsiders coming and getting land from the area, how are they going to, uh, what are they going to do? How are they going to approach the government or anybody? Which official they need to approach and all these things we build the capacity to do. And uh, also trying to build a social capital with the village where the villagers see them as useful people, not pain, not people who make their lives more miserable. So I think that's the thing. And so, and then we build a different, so, if you look at the CPA, Red Plus, Livelihoods, and the Community Patrol and Compliance, so these are different teams that are supported by WCS to carry out these activities. So these are different teams that work there. And all the teams basically have to develop the political and social skill, uh, the committee's political and social power, because they need to go different teams, take them to different officials, <laughs> It's a different process. Uh, ICT goes to different officials and the Red Plus goes to thing. And so it's, as you say, there's a lot of work. And all the teams also build the skills and the resource and the knowledge to work with the communities. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ashish. Uh, we can take the questions now. You can either leave the, leave your question in the chat box or you can raise your hand. So I stop sharing screen, yeah? Sure, yeah. Thank you. So we have a question from uh, Vinayak. Vinayak asks, yes. how can we access detailed information of reports on this case? Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you mean by detailed reports on uh, like Vinayak would you like to elaborate so, so anything uh, regarding like uh, more details like uh, you have explained us a uh, very uh, vividly, but uh, if I can get a report on what you what you did, like just a report, if you have created, uh, yeah, there are different reports. Uh, it's not all put together in one. So, like we are talking about this uh, conservation incentive scheme. So there is a report I think at the in uh, inter, the WCS internationally talking about. Uh, payment for incentives, uh, payment for conservation incentive schemes, uh, that's there. And that's with WCS. And uh, then uh, comparing the different 
uh, what you call conservation schemes, then we have uh, PhDs, people who have come and done reports, but all of them haven't put it into one uh, thing, but these are different bits that go all over the place. And uh, so, yeah, you have uh, the presentation brings it all together, but yeah, uh, there are like, we can give you other reports on uh, where we work with the government to develop uh, guidelines on uh, ma uh, mapping of community areas, mapping of uh, what you call the um, community zones. Then CPA, there is another report. So it's it's not in one big thing, but it's in many different bits and pieces. If that's is that okay? Yes, I'll check out uh, CWS uh, site. WCS, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sir, WCS. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, yeah. So WCS Cambodia. If you look at the WCS Cambodia website, uh, there is a lot of documents in the website also. And if you need more, then yes, you can ask me directly. Uh, I think my email address is there. So if you, we can give you a lot. But I think, yeah, uh, it just depends on how much you want and. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the question, Vinayak. Um, Ashish, we have a message from our country director, Vidya Atreya. She says, thank you, Ashish, for a very nice talk. Ah, yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do we have uh, any more questions, please? Uh, can I ask a question, uh, Saurabha? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Ashish, Vidya here. Yes, yes. Yeah. Th thanks for joining us. So I just wanted to know from your experience, you know, uh, different communities and different spaces are different, the politics of it, the culture of it, you know, uh, how easily can these uh, examples be used in an Indian context? Uh, I would say, yes, yeah, the situation is different, but uh, the question of, uh, it's more a question of transparency in the case of that conflict is where the committee chief, he wanted to, he was thinking that it will not be displayed. So he basically bought five tons, which is a kind of corruption and basically one ton from the rest. And when it was displayed, then uh, it became open and uh, basically the villagers asked questions and they discussed. So it's, as you say, is <clears throat> in this community, it worked, but in other communities, it may not work because uh, the supporters of the leader may start going against you. So this is a very, very delicate and how the facilitator has to understand. And as you're saying is it could work in the Indian context, but you have to be very careful and understand if it is possible or not. And we basically talked with the committee members before we did this. And they said, yeah, it can be done and uh, it'll, it may work. But before we did that, we had to talk with them. Uh, we make sure that they understand what's happening, except the chief, of course. But, yeah. So sometimes, yeah, we do do that. Thank you, Vidya. Uh, we have a question from Shama. Uh, she asks, any example of a conflict resolution besides the example you mentioned on the community leader? Uh, well, uh, we have many because many of the village chiefs, they start selling land, uh, that which is illegal. So basically, uh, they are not supposed to do it, but they do it. And now they don't want it taken out and they get really irritated when that comes out. Uh, the question is, how do we bring it out? And so basically, that's the time when the parks come in or sometimes the commune councils, we need to negotiate with them or with the land department. So this is where we, uh, yeah, we have to have good relationships with different organizations that are making those decisions. So government officers are become very important where we don't take the blame we basically blame the government department and say, can you raise this issue? And the government official raises the issue and we discuss it in the village saying we are totally innocent or something like that. So 
it just depends on how we try and get this uh, issue worked out i think yeah uh, it, it's not easy but yeah i'm not saying it so yeah we have done that also does that answer your question <laughs> Yes, yes. Can't hear you, sir. Yeah, no, I can hear you. Yes, thank you. No uh -huh. problem. So there is, yeah, is the incentive? Oh, sorry. Thank you, Shama. Uh, the next question, Ashish, is from Anand. Wonderful to listen to your initiatives involving communities. What methods do you use to sensitize communities about local biodiversity? How does the committee function to bring together government officials and villagers? Uh, yeah, I think uh, first thing is uh, sensitizing them to biodiversity. We don't start with that. So what we started with is tenure, tenure security. Uh, we talked to the village because they were having conflicts with the park authorities regarding uh, land that they could clear and they could not clear. And so we went in and asked them, do you want to solve this problem? And they said, yes. And we said, okay, yeah. the one way you can solve this problem is the government doesn't know what you're using. And basically you can put it on a map and we'll help you put it on a map. And uh, once that is there, and then you have to work with the department to negotiate which areas you use and which areas you don't want to use. And uh, they said, yeah, that's a good idea. And so that's what we did. And then as we were working with them, we developed the trust. And then we said, okay, well, you have this bird over here. Why, why don't you protect it? And uh, it's really important. And they said, yeah, why not? Uh, it's more that way rather than uh, going directly for in the beginning directly at conservation. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes, yes. yes. Thank, you. Thank you. We have uh, Aaron's question. Uh, would you like to? Um, yes, thank you. Um, yes, Ashish, thank you for this uh, really uh, interesting talk. And um, one of the things I had is you're dealing with a very sort of a difficult and a complex issue, you know, with a uh, history that's also very recent, you know, pertaining to the, you know, the Khmer Rouge and um, <clears throat> all that's happened in the recent past. And I think um, one of the big challenges that Cambodia is facing, as you rightly said, is the whole issue of land rights and, and tenure. Uh, considering this, I mean, you've spoken about some very interesting incentive schemes like, you know, your IBIS uh, friendly rice, uh, you know, some of your Red Plus programs, etc. Are you looking at any other sort of uh, long term incentives when it comes to this, particularly in, um, in the context of land rights, you know, something along the context of bio rights or what this uh, organization Recoff TC is doing in Thailand, where they're using, for example, uh, teak trees as a loan collateral for communities to kind of, uh, you know, make, uh, get loans from a bank or something of that sort. Do you all have any other sort of, uh, you know, ideas or incentives on what would work in the long term? Obviously, I know that this is uh, diverse and it's a complex situation, but if you could throw some light on that, would really appreciate. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think the thing is, uh, we took a different approach, saying that, like, if you look at the IBIS rice, uh, we have partners that implement it, and they buy it. And this is a whole company that has now become uh, IBIS rice company that is selling rice abroad. And we think that will continue, as long as the villages follow the guidelines, the rules, and everything, and basically... As long as that happens, I think uh, that that's quite that will be quite long term. Then the tourism again, if the birds exist, and we have another partner that brings the tourists in there, and that functions by itself, the community manage it. And now they are also having their own schemes of protecting the bird, like bird nest protection schemes, which they pay the villagers some money to not to clear some areas, or if the bird is. Uh, in the resin tree, then they pay the resin tree owner not to disturb the nest. And so this is something that they are doing. And in the long run, we see this as being more 
uh, effective because the problem with teak trees or timber trees is uh, in Cambodia, we are not sure in the future what happens. Uh, what we are seeing now is powerful people, they just come in and take over whatever they want. And if the village does have a teak tree plantation, uh, it may be like uh, uh, so you can see what the government has done is they, according to the law, they cannot put concessions inside certain areas, inside the protected area in the core zone, but they bypassed the law and just did it. And so if we plant important trees or something like that, uh, what are the chances that the government will not just take it away and say this belongs to us? So, or the government says you can't cut these trees because uh, these are important uh, national heritage. I, it's just the thing in Thailand, it is working. But, uh, so we, there is a scheme here that uh, basically the, the, the government, the NGO has got uh, what you call funding to provide the community about three to $4,000 year to protect uh, the lionfish and this is a deposit that the NGO has got from the donors and they are it is functioning and they, uh, they are functioning quite well but when the needs change and the demand change and the cost of the resource increases over time then uh, yeah i think more flexible programs are necessary like uh, what you said is Ibis rice or ecotourism that can just adjust with the times and give a higher price. I think that. But anyways, I think that's a long debate. I think. Thank you. Okay. Um, no, thank you for your you know response. I think uh, yeah, I point point well taken. Just wanted to know if there's anything on the on the land rights front, wherein, for example, communities who are participating in conservation. So is this. Like, uh, would you uh, see the the CPA and you know the ICTs as part of like a land rights scheme in a way? Uh, I think that is the whole thing. Is basically it is a land rights approach where we are trying to give the villages a rights to use the uh, area that they have been using over time, and so. And the law in the Cambodian law does uh, uh, allow that to happen, especially protected area law. There is a zone called the community zone, which basically uh, the communities can live in there and uh, have their uh, uh, farming and their residence. But what we don't know is, okay, if they're inside the protected area, what are the restrictions that they that will be applied by the government on them? because they're inside the park. So that is something we need to work on it. But at the moment, it's still under discussion. Yeah. But yeah, what we are doing is trying to give them, it is a land rights. That's what we are negotiating with the government to uh, understand the rights that the community has to continue using the areas that they have been using in a way that they have been using for the past uh, in the past, so like Sweden agriculture is not allowed in most parks, but in, in Cambodia, it is allowed inside a specific area, but we need to work with the government to define that. And we are still working on it. And uh, it's not yet wholly accepted, but that's what we are doing. But it's not, uh, we are working through the government system rather than uh, asking the community to go on uh, strikes or anything, but we are working with them to work through the government system. Thank you. Okay. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one more question from Shama. This, uh, she asks, will WCS's staff's responsibility be limited to facilitating between community and government? Or is there anything more that we can do? Uh, Yes, and this is where in Cambodia, we have that opportunity to also lobby, like we are saying, is okay, actually, uh, international agreements, uh, WCS global program has this kind of things, and we need to look, then you have the World Bank safeguards, you have uh, 
UNDP, all these things we do slowly work uh, and uh, we do lobby for more rights. But uh, we also explain to the community that they have a responsibility we, uh, that comes along with these rights because these rights do have responsibilities that, yeah, uh, somewhere you will also protect the wildlife and uh, you will uh, protect the habitat. So that's your responsibility. So we will bring you both together. Uh, this is your responsibility and this is uh, the government's responsibility. And uh, yeah, how do you uh, make those decisions is very much, sometimes we do support the government when we work with the communities because in the, in the village, a lot of rumors are there. The government has stolen this much money. This guy is a corrupt guy. That guy has done this and that guy has found somebody else. There are many stories like that. And then we sit with them, open the law and explain, look, this is the law. This is how much you're supposed to be fined. And they have fined you very little. So uh, at the same time, we also work with the government because there are a lot of rumors that the government team has that say this guy is illegal. This guy is a crook. That guy is a crook inside the village. So we try and get this kind of discussions that happen and uh, we bring them together and we try to make them discuss and it removes many of this uh, false uh, uh, ideas in the team. And sometimes they could be true, but I'm not saying that it's not, but yeah, it, it comes out and everyone is clear. I think that's the thing. Yeah. But yeah, as you can see, WCS staff, uh, they, they say in Cambodia, they say they are like a piece of meat between the board and the knife, and uh, everyone cuts them. I think that's what they say. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions? We still have three minutes to go. Hi, Saurabh. I, I would like to ask one question. Sure. Uh, this is Monali. Hi, Ashish. Uh, hello. Thanks a lot for the amazing talk. Uh, actually, I would like to know, after working um, for such a long time in uh, that, with that community, what that community expects from WCS Cambodia? Are you an educator for them or support system or uh, like consultant? Uh, for WCS Cambodia, uh, the Cambodia, the team, yeah, yeah. what community expects from you? Uh, what the community expects from us is, uh, I think that's what we have been clear uh, to them is, yes, we are supporting you because uh, we, you are protecting the wildlife. Uh, we cannot support you if you don't protect wildlife in some form or the other. And, uh, and we will help you. Uh, as long as you keep protecting the wildlife. And in the future, uh, we are building these structures and uh, 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 what you call procedures, uh, which the government may use and may not use, but uh, this is what we are doing. But earlier, yes, we were very powerful. They expected a lot from us, but now I think they know the government is the main people who make the decisions and WCS is in the sideline trying to negotiate and uh, work between the community and the government to come and to try and come to some understanding uh, of how to protect the wildlife and the park. Is that okay? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so that means it's clear to the community also that your role has changed now. Like the this is Cambodia's role has changed. Yeah, yeah. The involvement has changed. Yeah. Thank you. All right, with that, we have reached the end of the session. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Ashish, and for the insightful talk. Okay. Um, Great day and thank you all for participating. Uh, see you all in the next conservation talk.